the congregation to stand up. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, we would like to read the scripture passage that he is going to use for the sermon. Let us turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Verses 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Mateo 28, 18 hanggang 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Blessed be, blessed be our God for the reading of His Word. You may now all be seated. Uh, Maganda umaga po mga kapatid. Allow me to introduce our speaker this morning. And I will be uh, introducing him in English. Our guest speaker, before all of the other information that uh, we can read from the, uh, in, on the screen, he is a friend of mine. We used to be studying together in uh, Tokyo Christian uh, University. He was taking then at that time his master's degree in divinity, master's of divinity degree. He is my friend, and uh, of course, uh, what I can say about him is, uh, I can only see him in the shokudu, and also in the library, and in the chapel. Inside the library, he was always very silent, because he was reading, always reading and studying. Our guest speaker is the Associate Pastor of Ibaraki Bible Church in Osaka, Japan. He came all the way from Indonesia. In 1997, he entered Japan to study before God called him to PCTS and then later on he earned his PhD in Theology from Theological University of Kampen in the Netherlands. He is a part-time lecturer of Tokyo Christian University. He also serves as a lecturer at International Reform Evangelical Seminary. I think this is in Jakarta, Indonesia. And he is also the co-founder of Asia Kuiper Institute. He wrote a book entitled a free state in a, a free church in a free state. He's married to Yuko, I think. Yuko, Miss, Miss Yuko, and also they are blessed with two children, uh, June and Yuki. So let us praise the name of our God uh, in the life of our dear speaker for today, Pastor Surya Hareta. Pastor? Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Pastor Mon just introduced you, uh, again, my name is uh, Surya Harefa. And I am originally from Indonesia. And I never been living in English-speaking country. So my English is greatly influenced by Indonesian grammar and also Indonesian intonation. So yeah, please forgive my poor English. And my wife is Yuko, and she's a Japanese, and we have blessed uh, with two kids, uh, June, uh, 13 years old, and Yuki, 9 years old. The, the picture there is maybe around uh, 
six years uh, ago ya. Yeah. So my son already a little bit higher, taller. And by the way, I'm from Indonesia, and my father came from a small island in the northwest of Indonesia called Nias, Nias Island. And my mother is from a big island in southern Indonesia called Java. Maybe some of you know, not know about Java, yeah? Java. And some Indonesians say, if you combine Nias and Java, Nias and Java, it becomes Ninja. So perhaps that's why I came to Japan, <laughs> because I'm combination between Nias and Java. And by God's grace, after graduating from high school, I got a scholarship from the Japanese government to study Japanese language and to study marketing. And afterwards, I studied theology. And there, on the state seminary, I met a very diligent student from the Philippines. And his name is Felimon Mendoza. <laughs> and both of us uh, graduated in 2005. And since then, we haven't met each other uh, physically. So I'm really glad that after almost 20 years, uh, we can see each other again. And I'm impressed and I'm encouraged to know that how God uh, has been using Pastor Mon here in Villa Carolina Bible Christian Church. Uh, brothers and sisters, today I want to deliver a sermon entitled uh, Making Disciples of All Nations uh, from Matthew chapter 28. We already uh, read this part of uh, the Bible, and as you know, yeah, as you know, uh, this event in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, this event happened after uh, the resurrection, uh, before the resurrection, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, during a period of 40 days after his resurrection. Jesus appeared uh, to his disciples and to many people so that they really understood that Jesus had risen from the dead. And afterwards, Jesus ascended to heaven. He returned to heaven. And before he ascending to heaven, he delivered the words that we just read. In other words, those words that we just read are Jesus' last words. Jesus' last words to his disciples before he returned to the heaven. And usually, the last word of a person contains special meanings compared to other of his or her words. So, brothers and sisters, in the previous church that I served with, there was a woman who was very, very disappointed, very, very angry to his brother. Together with her brother, actually they planned to make a big birthday celebration for their mother. Their mother has, had been very old and very weak due to several illness. So they planned birthday celebration. If I'm not mistaken, it was her birthday, uh, 18, 80 years birthday. However, one week before the celebration, her brother brought the mother to accompany him to a far away place. And as a result, in a few days, the condition of their mother became worse and worse. And their mother eventually passed away just one day before the mother's birthday. So the plan, the birthday celebration plan was supposed to be a celebration 
full of joy. But now because of the deed of her brother, it became a funeral full of sadness. So she was very angry. She was very disappointed with her brother. But she stopped being angry. She stopped being disappointed to her brother. Do you know why? Because before her mother passed away, she left a message for her children. She said, My children, you all must live in harmony. Do not hate each other. If your sibling has done something wrong, please, please, I beg you, please kindly forgive him or forgive her. So when she heard what the, her mother told to, their, to her children, for her, it is very difficult thing to do. But because she loved and because she respected her mother and because of these are the very last words of her mother, so she decided to obey those words. The last word of her mother caused her to stop being angry, to stop being disappointed to her brother. So, brother and sister in Christ, I think this is also how we should deal with this Jesus' last words. His words, if we think seriously, it is very, very, very difficult for us to implement. But, let us decide to obey it. Let us decide to follow it. Let us commit to implement it. Because we love Jesus. Because we respect Jesus. And of course, because Jesus is our dear Lord. Because Jesus is our dear Savior. He has loved us. He is loving us. And He will always love us with much and much greater love. So let us decide to obey this Jesus last word. Amen? Now, let us see in more detail the content of Jesus' last words. We can divide Jesus' last words into two elements. First, comments, and then second, promise. First, let's see the comments element. There are four verbs or four comments in the first part of Jesus' last words. In these comments, we can see four verbs. Go, make disciples, baptize, and then teach. Yeah. And in the original language, the main verb of this commandment is the second comment. The make disciples of all nations. The make disciples of all nations is the main comment. So the other three words, go, baptize, teaching, they are participles. They are subordinate verb of the main verb, of the make disciples of all nations. So this means that the comment to go it's not just to go somewhere, but to go with a specific purpose. Namely, to go in order to make all nations disciple of Jesus Christ. And go also means being proactive. We should not only waiting for a good opportunity, but we are also to think, we are also to create those opportunities. And likewise, the, uh, the comment to baptize is not to just baptize somebody, but to baptize with a particular goal. 
that is to baptize in order to make all nations Jesus' disciple. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in order for someone to truly be a disciple of Christ, they need to confess their faith before God and also before other believers. Faith is indeed a personal thing. But this is a private matter that must be acknowledged publicly. Without public confession, our faith will not truly grow in a healthy and responsible manner. That's why we baptize people who believe and we baptize in order to make the person really become Jesus' disciples. Similarly, the instruction to teach is also not just to teach someone, but to teach with a clear-cut intention. Namely, to teach in order to make all nations disciples of Jesus Christ. As you know, the main characteristic of a student is studying. Learning from teachers involves listening, involves paying attention, involves imitating, and involves reading the teacher's writings. So, a disciple of Christ is a person who regularly listens to the words of Christ, pay attention to Jesus' way of life, and tries to imitate Him. And also, to read the Bible. It is written here that we should teach not only some or many Jesus' disciples, yeah, not only to teach some of Jesus' commands, but we need to teach all of Jesus' comments. And all means that we also need to teach about making disciples of all nations. In the beginning, the recipients, the recipients of these uh, comments were the so-called 12 disciples, without Judas Iscariot. And these 11 disciples were told to make disciples of all nations. They were commanded to go, to baptize, and to teach all nations. And as you can see, here it says that the disciples were to teach the nations to observe all that Jesus had commanded the twelve disciples. All that Jesus commanded means that this command to make disciples is also included. In other words, Although this command to make disciples of all nations was in initially, at the beginning, given to the twelve disciples without Judas Iscariot, but as the disciples are implementing this command, then those who become Jesus' disciples will also be given this command. The nations would also need to make disciples of other nations. So for us, for the nations, this Jesus' last words, last comment, have two implications. First, we need to be made disciples by those who have been disciples before us. Then, we ourselves need to make disciples, others who have not been disciples of Christ. Jesus' disciples must make disciples of all nations. Thus, it means that we must not only think about our own nation, we must also think about other nations. We must think about all nations. And the word nations here in the original language refers to ethnic groups. It usually means smaller and indigenous people group exist in a nation. You know, like in the Philippines, in one nation, there are many uh, ethnic groups. So maybe we can refer to the tribes in the Philippines, such as the Ilocano, the Pangasinans, the Kampangan, and also ethnic groups in Moro people, such as Bajau, Iranun, 
and Maranao and many other ethnic groups. In addition to that, considering today's development of individualism, perhaps we also can understand the term ethnic groups that we belong uh, as a group that we belong to, or that group that we share common values, common interests, uh, common social treatments. In either case, the term all nations means that we need to widen, to widen our vision not only thinking about our own family or own groups, but thinking about the other groups and even all groups in this, in this earth. So we need to make disciples in such a way that those disciples then will make disciples of all nations. And likewise, continuously. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we really take this comment seriously, we know that this is very, very difficult. Perhaps we can say that it is a mission impossible. Mission impossible. But thanks God, thanks to Jesus, because this comment ends with the second element of Jesus' last word, that is, promise of Jesus. So Jesus' promise, we can see at the end of uh, verse 20, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A promise that Christ will be with us. Christ will always with us to the end of the age. Many people, I think, love this promise. We will experience this promise. However, unfortunately, many people forget the context of this promise. It should be always be remembered that this promise, this great promise, was given after the command to make disciples of all nations. So brothers and sisters, you and I will actually be fully experience this promise if we carry out the command before this promise. And we will understand that this promise is very wonderful and very extraordinary thing when we understand fully who Jesus is. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. But He is more than that. As you can see in verse 18, Jesus begins His last words by mentioning that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You see here, all authority in heaven and in earth. So this shows Christ's authority as king. He's not only our savior, he's not only our Lord, but he's also king of kings. He reigns not only in heaven, but also on earth. Heaven on earth means everything, every place. So this Jesus who received all authority in heaven and on earth, he gave that command and also this promise. So we carry out this command, not only because this is the last word of Jesus Christ before he ascended to heaven, but also more importantly, because this is the command of the one who has all authority on earth and in heaven. Jesus is the second person of the triune God. And as a second person, Jesus is God himself. 
He has all the power. However, Jesus was incarnated. He came down to this earth to be the same as us, to be the same as human beings, as 100% humans. And as 100% human, Jesus had no authority whatsoever, just like when he was in heaven. He becomes just like other humans. He had to born to be born as a helpless baby. He must be raised by Mary and Joseph. And when Herod, the King Herod, ordered uh, the killing of every baby under two years old, Jesus couldn't escape on his own. He had to be evacuated to Egypt by his parents. And as a human, Jesus could feel pain. He could cry. He could suffer. Basically, it's exactly the same as we, as human beings. And he even could die. He could die on the cross. The difference between Jesus and other humans is that he could carry out every will of God perfectly. And he did not commit any sin at all. So when he died on the cross, he did not die because of his sins. He died because of our sins. He died because all of our wages of our sins were placed on him. And because Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, his death could be a substitute for sinful humans. And his death was acceptable to God. So when he died, he paid all the wages of sin. Namely by accepting the wages of sin. By accepting the death, the wages of the sin. And then when he rose, he defeated all the powers of sin and death that reigns in earth at the time. So that's why it is said, all authority, not only in heaven, but also on earth, has been given to Jesus Christ. And this powerful Jesus, this full authority of Jesus, He promised us that He will with us always till the end of the earth. What a great promise of Jesus for us. And with this kind of understanding, I would like to, for you to see the parallel between Matthew chapter 28 with Acts chapter 1. It's, uh, the letters are small, but I hope you can uh, understand it. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says like this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. I think on the Pentecost day, we usually read this verse. Yeah? So Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a promise given by the Lord Jesus before he ascended to heaven. The Lord promised that the Holy Spirit will come upon the disciples. And with the coming of the Holy Spirit, two things will happen. First, the disciples will receive power. And the second one, the disciples will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is very famous. And I think you have heard this first many times, and there are those who emphasize the importance of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, but unfortunately, they do not emphasize the command to being witness. And there are those who call for the importance for being a witnesses of Christ, but do not call for the importance of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. So this kind of 
one-sided emphasis. And I would like you all to emphasize both. Let us avoid the unbalanced emphasis. Let us emphasize both receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and also being the witness of Christ. These two things, they are related with each other. And they are, should not be separated. When someone receives the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will give power to that person. And that power is the power to be a witness of Christ. So if we understand this, we will also see the parallels, the similarities between Acts chapter 1, verse 8 and Matthew Chapter 28, uh, verse 18 to 20. In Acts chapter 1, the power of the Holy Spirit goes hand in hand with being a witness of Christ till the end of the earth. And in Matthew chapter 28, we see that the God's promise to be with us always is uh, go hand in hand with the command to make disciples of all nations. Can you see the similarity, the parallel? And next, if we see Acts chapter 1, verse 8, there are some places named there. Jesus mentioned Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. First, Jerusalem. This is the center place of Jewish people. And second, Judea, and this is the name of a region like a province. Like maybe Metro Manila or Laguna. I hope it is correct. <laughs> it's province name. And so... It is wider, wider than Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is just name of uh, name of a city. And third, Samaria. This is also name of a region located next to Judea, the province of Judea. But unlike Judea, the people of Samaria were exiled from various nations who were defeated by the Assyrians. So they intermarried with the remnants of the northern Israelites were not taken by the Assyrians. So they practiced Judaism, but only partially. And finally, the ends of the earth is a place inhabited by non-Jews. They practice different religion, they practice different culture, they speak different language from the Jewish people. So if we take the position of a Jew as a Jew living in Jerusalem, we can see the kind of developments in the meaning of those places. Jerusalem means fellow people, same people, same ethnic groups, same city, same culture. But then Judea and uh, Samaria means different city, different ethnic groups. But still similar culture. And then, the ends of the earth, it is different city, different ethnic groups, and also different cultures. Can you see the development? And so, uh, Ralph Winter distinguished these places as E1, E2, and E3. The higher the number, the harder the more difficult to evangelize, to do evangelism. So evangelizing, evangelizing the same uh, uh, people in the same city, people in the same ethnic group, people in the same culture, means E1, evangelism type 1. And if we evangelize, evangelize to different tribes in one country, 
although they are different with us, but they are still have a similar culture with us, then it is E2, E2, evangelism type 2. And when we evangelize people from different city, from different ethnic group, and also with different culture, then we can categorize that as evangelism type 3, E3. And there are many obstacles in each type of evangelism. But although there are many obstacles, we need to do uh, the whole this kind of evangelism. Brothers and sisters, and this is also one of the reasons why we, I and other pastors from Japan, come to Philippines. Because this means like this. If you see this, like in the Philippines, you have many uh, tribes. When you do inside Philippines, you can do uh, evangelism type 1 and type 2. But then, when you do evangelism, do mission work, to people outside your country, then you are doing the evangelism type 3. As you know, in Japan, Christianity in Japan is very small in number. Do you know how many percent Christians in Japan? Who think that there are 50% of Christians in Japan? Please raise your hand. No? Who thinks only 10% Christians in Japan? You, one, one, two. Actually, less than 1%. Less than 1% Christians in Japan. And, the average number of church members in, in, in Japanese churches is only 30. 30 members in one church. And one of uh, pastor in Japan, uh, Pastor Shimoda, his congregation only have 10 members. But, although we are small in number, we understand this kind of evangelism types and we understand God wants us also not only to think about ourselves but we also would like to do evangelism type 1, type 2 and also type 3. So that's why we come here to see whether there is a possibility to cooperate with you guys here so that we also can do E3, the evangelism We would like, although we have many limitations, but because of God's command, although it's difficult, although it's a kind of mission impossible, but we would like to get involved in making disciples of all nations. This is not easy task for us. This is also kind of mission impossible for us. But we would like to do it. Because this is God's command, and because also Jesus gave us great promise to do this difficult command. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let us use Jesus' comments as a guide for our lives as individual Christians, and also as a group of believers, as a church. Each of us may have many activities. Each of us may have many difficulties, many problems. But as even the fiddle Christians, let us also evaluate whether our activities have any connection to making all nations disciples of Christ. How seriously do we pray that all nations may become disciples of Christ? 
How much time do we use to make disciples of all nations of Christ? To do the E1 evangelism, to do the E2 evangelism, and also to do the E3 evangelism. How much money do we spend to make disciples of all nations? And also let us evaluate ourselves as a group of believers in a church. Many churches understand that they have four duties, worship, sacraments, fellowship, helping the poor, and witnessing. But for those duties, we conduct many activities such as Sunday service, Sunday school, Bible study, fellowship. While we continue doing those activities, we also need to remember that the direction of all our activities is to make all nations disciples of Christ. We need to arrange those activities. We need to arrange our budget allocations in such a way that contribute positively to the process of making all nations disciples of Christ. Finally, I would I want to close this sermon by reading Mark chapter two, verse one to five. This is a very famous story in Gospel of Mark. I will read from Mark chapter two, verse one to five. And when he Jesus he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Like this story, Making disciples of all nations is bringing people to Jesus, so that they can become disciples of Jesus. So each of us need to do evangelism. Each of us need to get involved in making all nations disciples of Christ. But we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot do it alone. We also need to work together. Especially in bringing all nations to God, it is very difficult. It is mission impossible if we do not work together. Working together, like the fourth man, to bring people to Christ. The way is not always easy. Often there are many obstacles, many hindrances. Many hindrances, uh, like those experienced by the four people. But interestingly, as you can read in the first one to five, what hindered the efforts of these four people were other people who were interested in Christ. They were gathering there to listen to the Christ, Christ teaching. But because of their selfishness to listen to Christ. They don't care about other people like the paralytic people, men. So sometimes, what hinders the evangelism are other Christians who did not really care about other person who have not been disciple of Christ. There will be obstacles. There will be difficulties in making disciples of all nations. These four men also were facing difficulties, but if, despite the difficulties, these four people in Mark chapter two they did not give up, and their struggle was not in vain. God, Jesus Christ, was pleased with their efforts, and He forgave and He healed the paralyzed man they brought.
to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that through today's sermon, we will be like these four people. We will not only bring ourselves to Christ, not only bringing our ethnic group to Christ, our family to Christ, not only bringing our nation to Christ, but also we work together to bring the unreached people groups in our country and in also in foreign countries. And by doing those things, we together making disciples of all nations. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great mercy to us. We are sinners, but you have mercy on us. Thank you, Lord. You give us your Son to come to this earth to die on the cross to save us, to forgive us. Thank you, Lord. And you even make us your children. Thank you, Lord. And also, today, we are reminded that you give us command to make disciples of all nations. But we also reminded, although this command, this task is very difficult, it's kind of mission impossible, but you also give us great promise. You promise that you will be with us. You will always be with us. You will be with us to the end of the age. You promise us Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that we receive gives us power. Power to be witness of Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. Oh Lord, let us really remember clearly, let us really understand clearly the command that you give to each of us. And let us get involved in, ev in every types of evangelism. Evangelism type 1, type 2, and also type 3. And let us also can work together to fulfill your command to make disciples of all nations. Please, Lord, bless us, use us this week and the rest of our life to be your instrument to make, to make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.